In a garden on earth, a hummingbird dances. Its wings flutter with a speed that to our eyes and to our camera recording equipment appear nothing more than a blur. We know the wings are there, yet they oscillate with such rapidity that they elude our full comprehension. Only when the moment is captured with a high speed camera do they reveal their real behavior. At the scale of the unimaginably minute, we find the atom. Around its nucleus heart, electrons dance in a manner reminiscent of the hummingbird wing, a kind of probabilistic blur known as an electron cloud, seemingly unknowable in their speed and journey until scientists evolved our most sophisticated instruments to grapple with the challenges of capturing the nuances of this quantum motion. And they just got a Nobel Prize for it. Last week, Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Krauss, and Anne Leher were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for developing a technique to measure the rapid processes in which electrons move or change energy inside atoms and molecules by using extremely short pulses of light, the fastest that have ever been produced. I'm an optical physicist, so I'm always fascinated by light, and the coverage of the topic I've seen so far has left me wanting a bit of a deeper understanding and explanation of to what is actually going on. So I wanna take a look at why this discovery is important, how it actually works, and what it unlocks for our understanding of the universe around us and how it actually behaves. So let's start where we always start, with Einstein. In 1905, Albert Einstein published the first explanation of the photoelectric effect, a strange phenomena where electrons are lost from the surface of material when it is illuminated by light of a certain frequency or higher. Einstein's explanation behind this effect proposed that light consists of packets of energy called photons. When these photons have enough energy, they can knock electrons off of their atom and out of the material. The photoelectric effect provided a key experimental piece of evidence for the quantization of energy, particularly the energy of photons, and was pivotal in the development of the theory of quantum mechanics. It also earned Einstein the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921. At that time, it was impossible to resolve the timescales that were relevant for this effect of electron motion, and it was assumed that it would always be impossible. So physicists treated the effect as if it was basically instantaneous. The fundamental question that this year's laureates made possible to pose was what is the timescale for the photoelectric effect? Let's start with why this problem was actually so hard to solve in the first place. For a long period of time, the shortest pulse produced by laser laboratories was about six femtoseconds. That is very fast, but it's about a thousand times too slow to see the motion of electrons, which occur on attosecond timescales. There are the same number of attoseconds in a second, a billion billion, or 10 to the 18th, as there are seconds in the lifetime of the universe, an unbelievably large number. Producing extremely short laser pulses, especially of those less than six femtoseconds, is challenging for about 10 different reasons. But let me just quickly tell you about two of them that I think are interesting and are related. A sine wave can be drawn and described by using a single frequency or wavelength. Lasers produce light by amplifying and resonating it back and forward inside a fixed cavity, a box with mirrors at each end and an amplifying material in the middle. The frequency or the wavelength of the light that emerges from lasers is some multiple of this length of the cavity. To turn a long continuous sine wave into a short square wave pulse and then to reduce the time duration of that pulse, you need to add together an almost infinite number of sine waves of different frequencies to square off those edges and reduce the pulse size. Lasers, as you can imagine, aren't easily convinced to do this just because of the nature of how they operate. What this is called is the bandwidth problem. Short pulses require a lot of frequencies added on top of each other. How short a pulse you can produce actually is is inversely proportional to the bandwidth, the number of frequencies needed to produce it. And it took us a while to work out how to make lasers to actually do this. The second problem is related to the first. In using many frequencies to produce a short pulse, you realize an annoying thing about the universe. Light with different frequencies moves through materials at different speeds. This is why a beam of white light breaks up into its component colors when it goes through something like a prism. In a medium that isn't a perfect vacuum, red light travels faster than blue light. Most of the time, this doesn't matter and it gives us nice things like prisms and rainbows. But if you're an optical physicist trying to make an ultra short laser pulse, this starts to affect them. As the pulse travels through the air, the front of your laser pulse starts to become a different color to the back of your laser pulse. This is called dispersion or in laser physics, it's called chirping. 
As you can imagine, this will affect any measurements you go to then take with these laser pulses. And are these real people problems? No, not really, but they are the sorts of problems optical physicists have to deal with. The drive to capture those ever fleeting moments of the quantum world is what propelled the groundbreaking work recognized by the Nobel Prize. As we drive to observe events on even shorter timescales, the evolution into the attosecond realm became not just desirable, but essential. So let's explore how an attosecond laser actually works. Attosecond pulse generation typically begins with a shorter but still ultra-fast laser pulse on the femtosecond timescale. The femtosecond laser pulse is focused into a gas medium, usually something like a noble gas like neon or argon, and the strong field carried by the laser ionizes the gas, ripping electrons away from the atoms in the gas. As the electrons are ionized, they are accelerated by the laser's electric field over a short distance or duration until the electric field changes direction, which pulls these electrons back and they recollide with their parent ions. If these recollisions happen with the right conditions, it can emit a photon. This photon's energy will be the sum of the electron's kinetic energy and its binding energy. This results in radiation that can be many times the initial laser pulse's energy, usually in the extreme ultraviolet range. These photons are emitted with multiples of a carrier frequency, a process called high harmonic generation. We said before the overlap of multiple higher order frequencies, a higher bandwidth signal can create maxima and minima of brightness. By tuning of this process, you can turn one very fast incoming femtosecond pulse into many even faster attosecond pulses. This is the basis of the attosecond laser. These pulses are essentially your camera shutter giving you a very short and crisp snapshot of an electronic system or an electron in motion. But how would you go about taking a picture of an electron? I wanna talk about that, but first I have to thank today's sponsors, Incogni. A 2022 report by the Identity Theft Resource Center found that the number of victims of identity theft has gone up by nearly 50% over the last two years. The likelihood of your data getting breached is constantly also increasing. Data brokers are out there aggregating and selling your data to the highest bidder. These sites can expose you as a result to a range of dangers, including identity theft, to people making purchases in your name, to other online scams. Getting your data out of these systems sometimes feels like a full-time job, which is why Incogni reaches out to your data brokers on behalf of you and requests your personal data be removed and deals with any objections from their side. I've just signed up and for the first 100 people to use the code Dr. Ben in the link down below, they will get 60% off Incogni. To keep your information safe online, sign up now and thank you to Incogni for supporting the channel. Now, back to the video. To make use of the power of attosecond pulses, usually we'd use a pump probe laser measurement technique, an experimental method that uses two laser pulses on a sample we want to take a measurement of. The first pulse is the pump, and it initiates a process in the sample, such as exciting electrons to a higher energy state, think getting the system pumped up. The second pulse, the probe, is then used to measure the state of the sample a short time after this excitation, essentially taking a snapshot of the system. By varying the time delay between the pump and the probe pulses, you can effectively watch how a sample evolves in real time, following the initial excitation. When this technique is applied to studying electron dynamics, it allows scientists to observe how electrons move, redistribute, interact, or do other things with their surroundings after being excited by the pump pulse. In essence, varying the time delay acts like the frames in a high-speed movie, where each frame captures a moment of the electron dynamics. Because that interaction changes the system, you need to take another frame again with a different delay to get the next step in the process. I saw a very sensible question asked at the bottom of one of the news articles on this topic that I read, which was, why don't you just use a single photon? Surely this is the shortest pulse of light possible. And absolutely it is, and quantum physicists actually do these sorts of experiments where they send an entangled photon or two entangled photons, one through a sample and one straight to a measurement device. The problem in doing these sorts of measurements in electron dynamics is that sending a photon in one at a time, you'll have a huge number of experimental snapshots that you need to build up an image of what's actually happening in the system. And each measurement will have a lot of noise on it. Noise in measurements scales as the square root of the number of photons, so it's always in your interest to send in high power lasers so you have more photons, lower noise into a sample rather than using low power single photon at a time systems. With this access to attosecond lasers, 
since we've been able to probe areas of physics that we thought were previously impossible. Like how long does it take for a particle of light to be born? the assumed impossible question to answer from Einstein's photoelectric effect. The foundation of quantum mechanics lies in the idea that energy levels in atoms and molecules are quantized. When electrons transition between these energy levels, they emit or absorb a photon. As we said before, the actual duration of this photon transition was assumed instantaneous or at least too fast to measure. But with attosecond lasers, we have started to be able to measure the time delay between when the electron is initially excited or ionized and when it recombines with the atom to all ultimately release a photon. It turns out there is a finite, albeit extremely short, time delay involved in this process. And here it would be really satisfying to give you a universal answer to this question, like 42 attoseconds, but the reality is it depends on the atom or molecule the photon is being emitted from. It ranges from a few attoseconds to a few femtoseconds, depending on what you're looking at. Understanding and controlling of the behavior of electrons at the attosecond scale is also interesting because it could enable researchers to use lasers to control chemical reactions that they can't by other means. This ability could help engineer new molecules that cannot be created with existing chemical techniques. And as you can imagine, this also matters in things like quantum computing using photons, where the behavior of an individual photon is critical in understanding the dynamics of photon emission and can aid in the development of more efficient or faster quantum devices. Nowadays, the breadth and depth of attosecond science is immense. It started as a fairly narrow field focused on multi-photon processes in atomic physics, but it has now expanded towards many different frontiers, from molecular physics to physical chemistry and condensed matter physics, as we can now observe timescales and some of the fastest phenomena in the universe. It is an amazing discovery, well-deserving of a Nobel Prize.